All right. Welcome. All right. Thank you. All right. Welcome to our Early Literacy Curriculum Council meeting on October 17th. Uh, it's good to see everybody. It's an exciting meeting coming up. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask Katie to um, take attendance. Sorry, I just had to unmute. I got a new laptop and it updated everything, so I'm still getting used to everything. Okay, um, Megan Dixon. Uh, present. Carrie Flitz. I think you said she's... Carrie's yeah. here, right? Yeah. yeah. Present. Present. Yeah, okay, great. Itzel, did Itzel join us? Not yet. I'll let you okay. know when she shows up. Great. Joe Garza? Yes. Bill Hughes is not here yet, correct? I am here. Oh, you are. Okay, yes. great. Katie Kos not ready for viewing yet. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Katie Koshabuski. Okay. Katie Koshabuski present. Holly Mares. Molly Mares present. Molly Mares. I'm going to get that right. I'm sorry. My eye looked right down because Holly's right after you. It's okay. It looks like I'm on this committee for a couple years, so it's fine. I'll get it right. Thanks. <laughs> Holly Prest. Present. Amy McGovern. Present. DPI staff. Laura Adams. Barb Novak. Okay. Thanks. All right. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? Motion to approve. Okay, and a second? I'll second. Thanks, Molly. All those in favor? Oh, actually, any questions or conversation before we, any adjustments that we need to make to the agenda? I don't think we can, but. In favor, say yes, and then type yes. Yes. To approve the yes. Sorry. Eat okay. and uh, no eat cell. So. Okay. That's right. And the minutes, which I will put up on the screen. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from last month's meeting? Motion to approve. Thank you, Joe. Do we need a second? Actually, any conversation? Forgot that part. Um, Did you, were you about to second? Second. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Itzel is now present. Okay. I'm here. Uh, Sorry, I was a little thank late. You. Thanks, Itzel. Uh, all right. So, without any further questions on or comments on the minutes from last month, then we shall vote to approve the minutes. All those in favor, say yes, type yes. 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 It's like everyone approved. Nine. Thank you. All right, back to the agenda then. So Barb, we'll turn it over to you for about 10 minutes for some DPI updates. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Theory. In theory, I'll stop sharing. Here we go. Well, friends, I have plenty of updates for you today. Um, I am this is what the, these are the items that the council asked for the Office of Literacy to review for tonight's meeting. So I'm gonna go in the exact order of what the council requested. 
So let's start with curriculum. Um, from the DPI end, we don't have any updates about curriculum at this time. You did request that um, I discuss DPI's role in the curriculum review this year, 2024, to produce the list for 2025. So I want to just review some of the things that happened um, around this time a year ago. Uh, our council members had a tremendous number of curriculum to review in a very short amount of time. Um, and simultaneously, they were getting to know each other, getting to know the ins and outs of Act 20, designing their own process, their own rubric for reviewing curriculum. There were a tremendous amount of things that were happening at one time. And DPI did review curriculums last year to ensure that every curriculum was reviewed. Um, this year, the council is in a much different place than you were a year ago. It's amazing um, what a year's experience can do. You have three submissions to review this year. Um, you've had those submissions for a little bit more than three months. Um, so you've also had a much greater time to work on reviewing the curriculum. You've had opportunities to refine your process um, very many opportunities to apply and refine your process. Um, as long as the council follows through on consistently applying their process to the resources that have been submitted, DPI doesn't see a need to review resources. If for some reason the council wouldn't be able to consistently apply the process that they've set up to, the res to all of the resources that have been submitted, then DPI would review. That's not at all what we anticipate happening. Um, you've got tonight meeting, tonight's meeting. You're very well situated for that. You have an additional meeting at the end of the month should you need more time to discuss. So I, I think the likelihood of DPI needing to review curriculum is very low. And again, that would only happen if the council isn't able to follow through on a consistent process for all three curriculum. You also asked me to talk about assessment. So I'll talk a little bit about screening and a little bit about diagnostic assessment. I think this slide is a review. It's sort of one of my greatest hits right now to remind people where they can find information about screening. Uh, really, it's this link on the bottom, the Wisconsin-specific Wisconsin Pearson page, where you're really, um, for the school and district folks who are listening in, this is the link where you're really going to get the information that you need and want about screener windows, what subtests are required at what grade levels, accommodations, training, rostering. It's all on this Wisconsin-specific Pearson page. Um, our current priorities, the department's current priorities in our joint work with Pearson are to check in with the districts that haven't signed in to their Ames Web Plus account yet. The mid-year window opens December 1st, and it runs through January 31st. So somewhere in that window, every school is required to screen every student in 5K through grade three. Uh, and if they haven't logged into their account at all yet, we're a little bit worried because <laughs> they need to log in, create their teacher accounts, and get all of their students rostered. So Pearson is making individual contacts with all 40 of those districts um, sometime next week, I believe. And I will be regularly checking in with Pearson to ensure that that number is steadily declining. Um, Pearson is also able to provide DPI with a list of um, roster discrepancies. So again, rostering is the process of entering your students and your teachers into Ames Web Plus so that you can administer the assessment. I can look at how many children uh, Ames Web Plus is anticipating will be rostered in each school or district. I can see how many children have actually been rostered. Um, and then I can see the discrepancy between what's anticipated and what's been rostered. In those places where a significant discrepancy exists, Pearson is looking to figure out what's going on. Um, so that we can make sure that we have done everything we can to be sure that every student is rostered. DPI will be running an automatic rostering again before the mid-year assessment window opens. We don't have an exact date for that. Um, 
there's this place that's actually ironically called a sandbox that both Pearson and DPI have to play in in order to test all the tech stuff to make sure the automatic rostering will run the way that we want it to. And Pearson is still playing in the sandbox. Um, so we'll know soon what the exact date for that automatic rostering will be for the places that want to use it. Uh, DPI is working together with Pearson to offer specific support for screening in mid-year for the big five, which are the five largest school districts in the state, Madison, Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha, Green Bay. Um, and we are in the process of ensuring the tasks that can be brailled are being brailled for our students who read in braille. Just wanna remind you about how to contact Pearson Customer Service. Um, the link on this page that works is the link on the top, and that goes to the Pearson, Wisconsin um, webpage. And that's where you can find the contact information for Pearson. Um, Pearson is logging all of their customer service contacts. They are um, working hard to be sure that there's consistency in their responses and that they're responding in a timely manner. Um, Pearson is an international company. Ames Web Plus is used internationally. And there are a lot of nuances that are really specific to the state of Wisconsin. And so I, one of their challenges has been making sure that their customer service staff understands when to give the um, memorized answer for Ames Web Plus and when to give a nuanced answer that's specific to the state of Wisconsin. Um, when we find those issues, uh, which is happening um, by people telling me that they exist or telling someone else at DPI that those issues exist, I let Pearson know right away and they're able to push out an update to all of their customer service representatives to remind them just how special and unique Wisconsin is to ensure that they're giving our customers the answers that they need. We have issued um, more extended guidance about screening in Spanish. Ames Web Plus does offer an assessment of Spanish literacy. It's not a translation. Um, it is an assessment of Spanish literacy. It was normed with first language Spanish speakers who are receiving all of their early literacy instruction in Spanish. I think that's important to note because that's the student population that was used to develop the norms. So when you start to use the assessment with kids who are dramatically out of that norming population, the assessment results might not be applicable. Um, so the, the guidance there is pretty extensive, um, and I encourage you to review that if uh, screening in Spanish, which is particularly for students who are receiving their literacy instruction in Spanish, is something that might work for your school or district. Today, uh, just a few minutes ago at the WCAS conference that I'm at, um, we announced that in about two weeks, we will be releasing guidance about the very, very rare situations in which the effects of a student's disability invalidate the screening results. Um, in those very rare situations where the effects of the student's disability invalidate the screening results, the IEP team may determine that the best thing to do is to proceed directly to diagnostic assessment. The diagnostic assessment is gonna get us what we need. We don't need to predict that they're at risk. We already know that. So the diagnostic assessment is going to give us accurate and in-depth information to write um, personal reading plan goals and benchmarks and instruction and possibly integrate those into a student's IEP. Again, that would be an IEP team decision and it's really intended to be very rare. So think about um, a first grade student who currently has a stutter. An oral reading fluency score for that student is unlikely to be valid and reliable because um, that's not the population the assessment is normed for. So in that case, they could advance the student directly to diagnostic assessment. Um, in these cases, uh, we're also probably thinking about students who are blind or visually impaired, students who are deaf or hard of hearing, perhaps students who communicate in ways that are nonverbal. Um, in those rare cases, the student would be counted districts have to submit a count of the number of students who are below the 25th percentile. So those students would be counted as below the 25th percentile and would proceed with a personal reading plan. Um, again, 
uh, I'm starting to get questions about diagnostic assessment more and more, which makes me understand that we're shifting from our worries about administering the screener into really thinking about what we're going to do with that data from the screener, which I'm so excited about. Uh, the purpose of diagnostic assessment is to gather valid and reliable information um, to guide the personal reading plan. One of my most commonly asked questions right now is, how do we know if a student is at risk based on the screener score? So I just want to remind you that um, 118.016, which is a state statute, requires, this is the box that's in the darkest blue on the left-hand side of your screen, requires us to assess two skills in 4K and five skills in 5K through grade three. Ames Web Plus did not have subtests that were an exact match for those skills. Like they weren't called the same thing. They don't have an assessment called phonemic awareness. They have assessments that measure phonemic awareness that are called other things. So the first thing that we did was work together with Pearson to determine which subtests need to be administered at each grade level. Pearson can't provide us at this time with a composite score that represents the exact subtests that are given at each grade level. So there's not a single composite score for 5K that includes just the four tasks that are required in 5K. Even if we were able to calculate that number, we don't, we have, we've just we just started. We haven't had any time to do any sort of a process to make sure that that composite score is actually has the classification, classification accuracy that we would need it to have in order to accurately identify students at risk. But Pearson does have scores at each grade level that are likely to accurately identify students at risk. So those specific subscores are what we're using at each level to determine um, a student's level of risk and their progression to diagnostic assessment. And you can see what those are on the right hand side of the screen. Is that Katie? It's Katie, yeah. Are you Hi, saying Katie. that, um, if you could just clarify what you mean, you're not saying that they don't have subscores for all of those components in each grade. They have them, they're just calling them something different? Uh, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, let me just double check. They don't, Pearson doesn't have an assessment called oral vocabulary, but they do have an assessment called auditory vocabulary. Um, and so that's what, that is the subtest that we're using to comply with that part of the law. In that subtest, kids are presented with four color illustrations on a page and the teacher says something like point to round and the kid points to one of the images and then the teacher turns his page point to porcupine and the same thing and the teacher turns to pay the page so they will have an individual score for auditory vocabulary um, as a measure of oral vocabulary but that particular subscore is not used to calculate their risk We can keep talking about that too. Um, you know how to get a hold of me. Thanks. Um, so I just want to share some myths and facts about diagnostic assessment. Districts are not, re DPI was by law um, per 118.016 required to create a list of diagnostic assessments that meet certain criteria. Districts are not required to use or purchase those assessments. They may be eligible for partial reimbursement if they do, but we don't have any firm guarantee on that. And you do not have to assess area, every area of diagnostic assessments that's listed in the law for every student. Um, because in some situations, there's just not a developmental match with where a student is and assessing more advanced skills. In diagnostic assessment, you do need to collect valid and reliable data that can be used to immediately inform the personal reading plan. Uh, so we are working together with our 12 CESAs to support schools and districts in developing a local early literacy diagnostic assessment system that ensures that locally you have valid and reliable tools that are available for each of the areas that are listed in the law and the highly trained staff is able to make matches between what's happening and what they're seeing in a student screener and other literacy data in order to match them with a just right diagnostic assessment that's going to 
get them the information they need to drive instruction. And it's a system. So if the first diagnostic assessment doesn't go deep enough for the needs of the child, there's another assessment in the system that would go deeper. And a huge thanks to our CSAs for really taking the lead in that process. I mentioned, I think in August or September, that DPI is required every October 15th to submit an annual report to the Joint Committee on Finance. That report is specifically detailed in 115.39 section four. It has um, items A through G. Items A through F are entirely about the unfunded literacy coaching program. Uh, so we weren't able to report anything about a program that we haven't been able to start because we don't have the funding. Item G is asking DPI to report on the number of teachers and administrators who've completed the professional development training requirement in Act 20. That report only has to be filed this year for the year 23-24 and next year for the year 24-25 um, because those training requirements for administrators have to be met by July 1 of 25 and teachers have to be enrolled by July 1 of 25. So we had a 62 response, 62% response rate with a 100% response rate from the big five, which I'm very excited about. And you can see, I can't see it because I have a lot of things going on on my small screen. You can see that um, there are fewer than 10% of respondents who um, have administrators that haven't started the training. And there are around 16% of respondents who have teachers who haven't started the training. Hold on. I are you saying that 62, you're saying that 38% of the school districts never responded to your request? Correct. For information on professional development training. They just didn't respond. The survey was sent um, two weeks before the start of the school year and was due in mid-September. We did extend that um, at least a week. Um, and next year, we uh, certainly plan to send it out earlier. So what's going to happen, though, to those school districts that never responded? You're just not going to know until next year? You don't intend to follow up to make sure they're on track or see if they have any questions? That's something that um, we haven't talked about at DPI. Um, I honestly was very focused on making sure that we were able to meet the deadline of the report. And that's certainly something that um, your suggestion is certainly something that we can take into consideration, Katie. Is, is there a list of the districts that haven't responded that a outside group could request and then follow up with the districts? So for certainly example, you could do that through an open records request group could open record that request and then yes. follow that up. Yes. Okay. I All just right. want to add one thing um, as being one of those districts. So we had our teachers complete this over the summer in one of the approved programs and um, we have not received all of their certificates that they get at the end, which is the proof of completion of passing. Um, so we're just waiting on one or two, but there's also that, that part of they do it independently. Um, that was their summer PD and we have to get that letter. So it's, um, you know, gotten some, but just so you know, that is, a you know, in, in my particular case, that is what we are, what I'm waiting on. It's helpful to know that. And, and again, I would add here that the um, this portion of the state statute says that it is individual school boards who are ultimately responsible for ensuring that their administrators and their teachers, um, relevant administrators and relevant teachers, complete the training by July 1, 2025. So... Our we have DPI has communicated to school district administrators that and to the Wisconsin Association of School Boards that that's that is something that is their responsibility to ensure that they complete. DPI's responsibility is collecting the data and reporting it, but ultimately um, DPI it is the local school board's authority to ensure that uh, those relevant personnel. Uh, complete the training by July 1, 2025. Laura, I yeah. actually agree with you on that, that it, I mean, yep. the, the request, it sounds like went to 
principals or elementary administrators, um, which was a decision that was made. Um, but um, ultimately, it's the superintendent and the board that's responsible for that. And in fact, when I had conversations with some superintendents about this, they said, well, our principals would roll that right up to me. Three different Milwaukee suburban superintendents said that. They'd roll that up to me and respond. I'm not going to ask if they actually did or not. But it also goes to, it's the district's responsibility to comply with Act 20. And a group like Forward Literacy is out there to actually um, watchdog some of that. So um, that would be, I think that would be interesting and fully understand that the need to likely go through a open records request to do that and actually not hold DPI responsible, but get to the intent of the law. That letter for us, Phil, wasn't sent to principals or myself. That was sent to the superintendent. Oh. Um, it was sent to building. I, I sent it. Um, it was sent to it was sent to building principals uh, or people who identified as the administrator of the building. And if a superintendent or a curriculum director or someone similar emailed me and said, we want to respond for our whole district at one time, I just sent them the links for every school in their building. I'm sorry, every school in their district. We also know that that is that's a population of individuals just like our um teacher population, our workforce population, that has had a lot of turnover. And so I will also say we got, um, Barb got quite a few thousand bounce backs. <laughs> and so a sometimes, <laughs> so sometimes I didn't have, yeah. identifying the, the correct person um, may, have, may have taken some time. And it's also possible that for some districts, we, you know, the, the right person did not get the survey in their inbox with uh, yeah. an appropriate amount of time. Um, I don't have any updates on legislation um, because the legislature is not in session. Unfortunately, I continue to have no updates about joint finances actions related to the money that's earmarked for Act 20 because they have taken no action. Uh, and you can expect a full budget proposal from DPI um, in mid-November, and that will include some early literacy items. Um, the next priorities uh, for me at DPI are working with my colleagues in special education to finish the guidance around those rare cases where students will progress or advance to diagnostic assessment. Uh, there are 24, 25 reporting requirements that are part of Act 20 uh, that need to be submitted by each district. And so I'll be holding some sessions early in the new year about what those reporting requirements are and how DPI will be collecting that information. Um, I'll be doing some professional learning alongside folks who are in classrooms with very high percentages of students with personal reading plans, how they're tackling that challenge. You are working together to make sure that there's an updated uh, curriculum list if there are updates to be made for 2025. There are translations available for the parent caregiver letters and the family history survey. They're done. I just need to do the technical work of getting them linked on the website. And then there will be a 25-27 budget proposal from the department. As a reminder, the department submits this is a little, this is a little schoolhouse rock for you. Uh, maybe someday Laura and I will actually like be able to like chant it or wrap it. Is that what they do? I don't know. So DPI and each of the state agencies submits their budget to the governor's office. The governor's office makes a proposed state budget. That proposed state budget goes to the legislature. The legislature makes the final budget, um, takes their votes, and then it goes to the governor who can use uh, his line item veto, uh, and then the budget is hopefully passed before June 30th. So the things that DPI will propose in their budget are by no way a guarantee. Um, so our budget is a proposal that will work its way through the entire process. So I don't want to get your hopes up thinking that if DPI asks for it in the budget, we're necessarily going to get it. It's more like a wish list. 
Um, so I appreciate your time and um, your dedication to this overall issue. I think you really recognize that the work of making the curriculum list is uh, a cohesive part of everything else about the relevant statute. Um, I don't know that I will have many updates in two weeks when you meet again, um, but I will certainly let you know if I do. Thank you, Barb. Okay, we are gonna move on in our agenda. We are on item six, oops, which is our curriculum list update. So with that, there are some specific things on this curricular list update. We are gonna just quickly review our program scoring protocols so everybody's on the same page, discuss some questions that have come up about 3 queuing and MSV, and then um, there'll be two curricula that we are prepared to make um, decisions on tonight because they have all nine scores submitted. There's one resource that we're still waiting on a couple of our council members to um, to finish adding in their scores. And there is, um, it is, while we had extra time, we all took it really seriously to be sure we were thoroughly vetting. And I appreciate the work that the hours of work that it's taken everyone to do this, um, to do this important job for our state. So with that said, um, we will ground again in our guidelines. So this is, uh, we approved our ELC operating guidelines in June. We can share that. They should be posted somewhere. I know they're attached to minutes. And so this particular section is related to the work around evaluation. So the vendors have submitted their resources through the rubric that we have posted on the Wisconsin Reads website. And we then independently vet the resources um, and as if you've been watching our meetings, we have um, had conversations, not so much about what was in the resource specifically, but about where to find things. So that's what we did in our summer meetings and in September. And this was the date that we set to say, okay, when we'll, we will review in public the, the resources that we are ready to review. Because you'll see down here, Last year, we allowed, because of the large number of resources that we had and the very short timeline, we had made a decision to allow for seven of the nine of us to um, be the ones who, if there were seven scores, then we would review it. This year, because we had extended time, we need all nine members to review, and that's when a resource will be um, discussed, when we have all nine scores in from all nine members. So uh, any resource, so there are 10 categories that we have reviewed in our rubric. Um, we'll go over those shortly. And the categories are all, there's multiple um, features within each one that we thoroughly reviewed. And then a score is given, uh, one being minimal, four being exemplary, three uh, sufficient, uh, two minimal, um, and of course, one not present. So 4321, any program on average that scores three or higher is an automatic yes because there is sufficient evidence within that resource to support moving it forward to the Joint Committee on Finance and DPI. Uh, any resource that scores between 2.8 and 2.99, again, on that collective average of the 10 um, areas, we will have a conversation about and determine as a team what happens next. Any program that scores below 2.8, well, um, it's too low for us to say that there were things missing. And so we're not gonna move that resource forward. We have also um, determined that we would not vet the same resource unless there were changes to it. So two of the three things we vetted this year were partial things that were submitted last year, but there's been changes or updates. 
Council members, have I missed anything? This is kind of a summary for our audience, but I know that it's um, review for all you. Uh, so with that's our process. So we we're, um, we can move into discussing the resources and then the three queuing, or we can talk about three queuing first and then the two resources that are ready for review. Could we move forward with the two resources, please? Yep, let's do that first. So the overall score for Great Minds, Wood and Wisdom, Geodes, Wilson Foundation. So we have already reviewed Wood and Wisdom and Geodes. Wilson Foundations was the new piece that was added in and that program received a score of 3.12. I will pull up the um, document, Carrie and I, Carrie did the magic on creating the formulas. And then um, <clears throat> you can see these are all the categories, many categories. So uh, I'm just gonna scroll over. This was the overall general category. Um, so this is organization of the resource, um, professional learning that's provided, assessment system information, the design, overall design, those are things we were look, looking for in the general uh, category rating, received a 2.889. Next category was comprehension, um, 3.2 for comprehension, plus some fours in there, meaning exemplary. Then we looked at uh, background knowledge, that received a 3.3. For Witten Wisdom Geodes. So strong scores there. Vocabulary also strong, 3.1. Language, same thing, 3.1. Phonological awareness. So this is where the foundational skills are being taught through foundations in Wit and Wisdom and through the use of the geodes resource as a decodable text that also has knowledge building attached to it. So phonological awareness scored a 3.1. And phonics was quite similar. Scrolling down many areas with phonics, irregular words, segmenting and blending, um, cumulative review of the skills, space practice. Um, these are all separate items that we checked for, the logical sequence of the patterns, and then was there advanced word study? So that scored a 3.1, sufficient. Next category was the spelling, which is related to the decoding. So it's decoding and encoding go hand in hand and the score to three, uh, the foundation's curriculum generally teaches the letter sound relationships and then has the kids spelling them. That was pretty consistent. And then there's application in both the decodable passage that's in foundations and with the geode stories. Next category was writing. Um, Basically, for writing, we're looking for is the writing process taught? Um, are we writing to learn in this resource? We're using writing to enhance the comprehension and vocabulary. Is sentence level writing discussed? And you can see that we were, you know, mostly consistent in our scores. We, uh, which I think is great to see for our resource for our team here. Um, so overall, writing scored a three point three. There are some strengths in the wit and wisdom resource related to um, teaching the structure of writing and uh, building it from kindergarten through grade three. Next section was on fluency. Um, so fluency with letter names, fluency with text reading, words and phrases. So this would be coming through a combination of the foundational skills work and foundations, and then the close reading work that would happen through uh, wit and wisdom and, this, and ideally some small group work. And that received a score of three. So overall, the uh, scores were 
combined and, or averaged, if you will. Uh, we did not take any scores out, like a, eliminating a low or a high. Uh, so the overall average for all 10 categories amongst the nine of us is a 3.12. So with that, any comments or questions from our council? I, I do like have a, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I do have um, a few concerns that I had found as I was reviewing um, that looked like um, queuing. And there was one, uh, one that said, let's see. So in, inside the inside geodes document, it says, if students struggle with a proper noun, it is not yet decodable, read it for them. If they struggle with another word that is not yet decodable, encourage them to use context clues or pictures along with their emerging decoding skills to determine the word. If they are still unable to read the word, tell them the word. And I'll put it, I'll put that in the chat and I'm just wondering what other members thoughts are on that. Anybody that wants to address? Yeah, I can tell you my thoughts on that. So um, I see where that pings a few of the areas that might be considered three queuing, but for me in that language, at no point did it say when you're using context or picture cues to just let them lean on that other knowledge and move on. Um, it still suggested using that in partnership with their emerging decoding skills. So when I envision that, I I would envision like leaning heavily on that initial initial sound to move students through that. That's kind of how I justified that as not checking that MSV box, but I see how it pings a few, it's not far off. Any other comments? Thanks, Molly, that's helpful. That's the way I looked at it as well. Um, I did not over, uh, because of the foundations component being such an important piece, there is no foundational skill in wit and wisdom. Geodes is the decodable text and it only comes with that one little teacher's guide, which I suspect the teachers may not even look at that closely, that they're really use, you know, putting the books in front of the kids and having them read and, and using what they're learning from the foundations lesson, applying that. Um, so that that's kind of where my head went, even though the language was there. Um, anyone else wanna chime in? Katie, I'm wondering if you can, you've had some strong opinions on queuing and I'm wondering if you can, like, how do you see that? I prefer that they would just cross that off. You know, they should, they should just stop with uh, the decoding portion. Um, but as I look through the curriculum, you're absolutely right. I think Amy saw that that the, it wasn't found in any other any other portions. I did find something in the vocabulary strategies uh, using context clues, and it it definitely that was definitely cueing. But DPI gave guidance that that was okay to use for vocabulary and comprehension. Um, so. I just wanted to mention it because I had found it and I, I, you know, I had sent it to the group. So I thought it was worth mentioning again, just to make sure that um, if anybody had differing opinions that they had an, an opportunity to say so. And uh, for the audience, we um, are very aware of not ever having a walking quorum. So um, messages are, are sent, uh, you know, like, Hey, look at this. And then that's where it sits. So then it creates so we have to wait until we are all together to have these in-depth conversations uh, as we are. So that's um, that's part of the, the why for this. When things are being discovered on a second look, we need to bring it to the group and have this conversation. So um, thank you, Katie, Holly, Molly. Anybody else that wants to chime in and um, on that? Could I just ask one more question? Because GEO was part of something we already approved. And I didn't see any differences. Now, I, 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 it could be I might have missed a difference, but I don't. I think it was the same thing that already we placed on the list as a resource. 
Actually, and after Katie brought that up, I literally pulled up last year's because uh, we can still get to that mm -hmm. and this year's and did like a side by side. It's identical. Okay. With wisdom and geodes is the same. So, and we did already approve that. That's right. We just must not have looked at this document or some whoever, if anybody found it, then it came to that same conclusion. I just thought we should discuss it because I had sent that email. Thank you for clarifying, Amy, that we hadn't discussed it in email. That's why I wanted to bring it up here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's important. Yep, and it's going to come back around. So we're gonna, we're not done. All right. So um, with that said, are we comfortable? I just put a basic motion in the on the slide. It can be changed um, because it meets our guidelines of scoring the three point or higher that it would move on to the list for DPI and Joint Committee on Finance. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Great Minds, Wit and Wisdom, Geodes, Wilson Foundations to be added to the curriculum list that will be submitted to DPI and JCF on November 1, 2024. I will second that motion. Any discussion? Sorry, I did want to mention that while I think the last time our, our rubric ratings were made public, is that accurate? Uh, Joe, do you yeah. mean like we gave them out or do you mean we put them on the website or do you mean we talked about them in the presentation? I, I, well, first we talked about them. I knew that, but that they were posted somewhere. Is that accurate? They are posted. The rubric ratings from last year are posted. Correct. So then I guess the only thing I would ask is if we can just add some of the commentary that Katie has shared for districts to consider as they review these as their potential curricula. I do have them in the, I had uh, the spots that I found in my comment section, Joe, so. Oh, perfect, um, perfect. And I as would, soon as it's there, then, then at least districts can go in eyes wide open make as they go to make their own decisions. Yes. Right, and I listed that other spot that I had found it for voc vocabulary also. Excellent. This is this is Laura Adams uh, from DPI, and I I think this is just an, appropriate place to insert and let you know that there were a number of districts who um, engaged in their own open records requests to see the, the complete comments of the council on the curricula that you reviewed last year. So that that is something also that districts are are aware of as is something that they that they could do in order to help inform their own uh, curriculum review processes. What you have posted for last year does not include any of the comments and you as a council made a motion and voted on exactly what you wanted DPI to post. It would be helpful for me if you did that again this time after you're through all the all the reviews that you need to do. Yeah. I guess I I mean based on it would be really hard to post all the comments. I would think if if we wanted to link all the comments somewhere that somebody go in and seek them out, but it would just muddy the document, which is the overall scores in each of the categories. So we can have that discussion when it seems relevant, but there may be complications with that. Yeah, fair enough. I'll guess I'll, I'll uh, revoke the comment for sake of consistency, uh, but my motion still stands. I think, Joe, what you could do is just, ref and, and Barb, I think you could just refer people to the video of this meeting and they would hear the comments that Katie made. That's possible. I don't think it would be uh, difficult to capture by program because we only have three this year, um, a summary of the comments that were made for each section and have that be a link, right? Like not a something you open and see them all, but it's a link maybe at the bottom of the chart. Um, that when you said that, Barb, that's what I thought of. Um, and Joe, Amy, can you clarify? So you're talking about the individual comments that council members are making on the review forms. Is that right? Yes. Now we could also. Um, I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Right. We certainly could um, together, like with a collective. You know, what's what is our statement about? each of the 10 sections mm -hmm. as a collective council versus the individual ones. And then that might be easier to read rather than combing through. Um, That's just something that I want. <laughs> yeah. 
Because I wonder if people are looking to the overall council scores and then they're looking at the comments, if they would interpret that as if those are council comments and not just one individual member's comments, um, because I think those could be different. Yeah, it's, that's that's. Can absolutely I just do a true. point of order, quick point of order yeah. though, because we have a motion on the floor, and we could, if if Joe's not amending his motion to include that, then we should vote on the motion, and then we could talk about how we want to post things. But thank you, Katie. Let's do that. Let's vote on the motion. There was a second. Is that right? Okay. Joe mo made the motion, and Holly seconded it. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor, say yes, type yes. And that would be for moving the foundation's Wilson um, Wisdom Geodes curriculum forward. Yes. 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 Okay, hey, unanimous. Passes 9-0. All right. Should we... Um, should we talk about Lavinia next and then come back to this conversation? Because it's, it's we just know that we need to have this conversation about what to do with the comments. Is that fair? Please. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So Lavinia scored 2.89, which puts it in the category of having discussion and determining what we do with Lavinia. That would require a vote at the end on whether we move it forward or we don't. Um, I'm going to show you the scores, and we can look for some discrepancies, some areas of agreement, and go from there, if that sounds reasonable to everyone. Okay, so under the main category section, that received a 2.8, and... Um, so we had fours and twos, which balanced it out. Uh, they canceled each other out. Um, areas that were up. I mean, for me, the challenge with what I gave it a, a slightly lower score only because um, we only had half the curriculum to look at. We we had the first three of the six, and that kind of bugged me. You could you could make some assumptions by looking at the next scope and sequence, but I would have preferred to have access to the entire thing, not just the first three. And the other piece that was a challenge was the um, the portal. The portal was uh, not as friendly, so that that was for me the where it went. Um, others. Overall comprehension score to three, that's good. Overall background knowledge, 2.6. Vocabulary building, slightly lower, 2.4. Oral language, score to three. Phonological awareness, this was a strength, score to 3.1. Same with phonics, I believe. There we go. Yep, phonics also a 3.1. Spelling slightly lower, 2.8. All writing, 2.7. And fluency was a three. So with that information, I'm going to open up the floor for conversation about um, perhaps we should focus on the sections that were below three. Writing was 2.7. Spelling 2.8. Vocabulary and comprehension were lower. Slide back. Oral language is a three. Vocabulary was 
There's a range of scores under vocabulary. Did not see eye to eye on that one. Um, same with background knowledge. But comprehension got a three, which I find interesting. So comprehension got a three, but background knowledge got a 2.6 and vocabulary got a 2.4. Thoughts? For the background knowledge, Amy, they um, in their um, introduction guide, I forgot what they call the program guide or, or their overall view of the curriculum, they put in there that um, they were not focused on background knowledge. And, and, and so it, that was kind of evident um, in that. It seemed like the background knowledge would mostly be from um, those sections at the end of those readers uh, that hopefully a teacher would read. But yeah. that wasn't really clearly stated, I don't think, in the in the program. I didn't find that. Maybe somebody else did. I can speak to the a little bit of a different thing as far as the background knowledge. Um, they had one theme for the entire year and just a different filter of that theme throughout the entire year. So rather than being exposed to commonly known themes that are going to be on frequent standardized assessment pieces, they would only have been exposed to basically four themes throughout kindergarten through third grade. So I thought that that was, um, that was a, that was a miss for me. Okay, that's, those are really great comments. Others? Yeah, given the uh, background knowledge and vocabulary uh, disparities, I will not be supporting this curriculum. Those of you that scored it higher, is there anything that you would like to counter on our colleagues that have the critiques? Um, I know specifically for background knowledge for me, one of the reasons that um, I thought it was stronger than some of the other programs is that the decodable text also helped to build background knowledge. And I thought that was a real strength. Not only did the decodable text build background knowledge, but then there was specific prompts and additional information for discussion and discourse, which I thought contributed to vocabulary development and comprehension as well. Um, so that was why yeah, I thought that there was a balance there with background knowledge, but that's why I scored it a little bit higher. I noticed that too, it kind of compares to geodes with the decodable text building some background knowledge. I just wanted to say in case anybody from Lavinia is even listening, I think they're close. And if they do some revisions, I think they can actually get approved in the future. Um, I thought that I know that we had some concerns about equity that we discussed in our last meeting, and I felt like there definitely was a concerted effort to put some equity um, topics into things here. So I felt like I wanted to approve it. I, I wouldn't support it right now, but um, I think they're close. Yeah, from the foundational skills perspective, uh, there was a lot to like. Um, there, uh, and even the, the parent communication, I thought that that letter that could go home with parents that would give them specific things to do was really a, a strength. Um, easy to read. Yeah. I thought I, um, Amy, I, I do agree with you with some of the parent communication. I also saw the flip side of that um, as a teacher. I felt like the program did make some assumptions on some language and literacy skills of families um, and did have a, I wrote that as one of the questions if, if we um, got to this point, like what is, uh, what was essential or required because it did feel like the, the homework was almost like a required part of the program. Um, so what pieces of that would be required for families and what pieces would be like supplemental and, and supportive at home? And then how could you engage uh, families that English wasn't their primary language or literacy skills weren't um, well matched in the home? Yeah, agreed. 
yeah, thing that I did really but, like about this, per oh, go ahead, Joe. No, I actually was just inquiring about Etzel, about her comments, piggybacking on what was just said. I tend to agree with Megan. I thought there were really some strengths with the decodables. I appreciated the background knowledge piece and the pieces in those books. I appreciated the multicultural aspects of a lot of the readers, the read alouds, authentic texts, um, you know, kudos in that area. Um, as I hear other comments about the background knowledge, I, you know, am open to those suggestions and, and ideas. Um, but I did, I did like the decodable books. I think that, um, like you said, there could be some areas to tweak um, and, and they're very close. I was really excited to see the multicultural piece. That that was something that um, I appreciated and I tended to score a little higher because of that. Is there a way to get this feedback back to um, the publisher? Great question. Uh, I'm gonna lean on our director of literacy to maybe help us with that. <laughs> we, any thoughts on that, Barb? And how sure. we get some feedback back to Lavinia? Yeah, you tell me what to communicate to them and I would be happy to send it. Okay. Um, probably wouldn't be doing that until after we finished reviewing all three submissions for this year, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments that and certainly we could send them the recording and tell them to listen to <laughs> the conversation as well. Any other comments or are you, do you feel ready to vote or um, do we need to discuss further? I would like to make a motion not to approve Lavinia curricula as presented. Do we have a second? Or do you want to rephrase that, Howie? I saw your Yeah, face. I was just wanted, can we rephrase it so we can vote against it so we don't have a double negative? And I'm yeah. happy to a motion to approve Lavinia as submitted, and then we can vote against it if that's our choice. That's better. Let's, if, are you okay with the update, Joe, on the wording? Sure. Okay. I'll we'll withdraw my motion. I'll okay. second Holly's motion. All right. So we need to type that into the chat. Somebody wants to put it into the chat so we can all read it. I'm putting it in. Thank you, Holly. Okay, thanks. Then I'll copy it. Okay, so the motion, I, we move to approve the Lavinia curriculum as presented. Do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second it. Thank you, Bill. Okay. And all we've already had our discussion. So all those uh, in favor say yes, type yes. All those opposed say no, type no. 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 Okay, it looks like we have unanimous on the nose, nine nose. Um, and again, Lavinia is close. So if they can take our feedback and make some adjustments and resubmit, we'd love to review it again with, with some updates. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna bounce back to our agenda. Um, is there anything further that we need to talk through about three queuing? probably going to come up again on the 29th when we look at our final curriculum. So I know that the DPI um, is giving guidance on this at some point. Do we have a timeline on that guidance, Barb? The things that are necessary before the guidance are um, completion of an open inquiry related to a concern about curriculum um, that was received and decisions by the council about the curriculum that are currently on the table um, because there was a 
because there were questions about whether three whether three queuing was present in questions already asked by the council about whether three queuing was present in the curriculum that was being reviewed. Uh, it's important that DPI's guidance not seem to be favoring any particular um, curriculum. So we are pausing on the guidance until the curriculum review and your curriculum review, as well as the um, review of the complaint that was received are completed. So what I'm hearing you say is that we will not get guidance from the DPI before our process is done. No. Okay. And I, I want to interject and share that I think we need to remain consistent because we reviewed this resource, part, part of this resource last year. And the um, some updates have been made and they added another component. So it is important to, to acknowledge that it also made that same 2.8. It was in the window last year and we had a conversation about it. So at this point, we will com finish completing the resource because of the process that we already went through last year and how it came forward um, this year. Uh, so I, I just feel like we're really far down the line and then it's necessary for all of our scores to be entered and to have that conversation on the 29th about where we go next with this resource based on the scores. I do have a question. Um, I am... I'm wondering if a council member contacted you uh, to reach out to the publisher or how did the publisher get contacted? Did DPI contact the publisher or did a member request that? How did? I, I did know. ask. I did ask the publisher that um, when I received the email that I forwarded to you, the publisher said that they received the information from people on their sales force. Just curious. I was too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did have another question for you and it's gone. So I remember it in a second. Thanks. I think you turned your camera on. Is there something you wanted to add? Oh, you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> you're good? Yeah, sorry. I was just coughing, so I turned my camera off because I was... Oh, whatever. no worries. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Um, Megan, I love seeing you in your classroom. <laughs> right? Like, it's such a vivid reminder of why we are doing what we are doing. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yes, same. Yeah, I guess would, I, Amy, I, guess. I would just like to remind the council too that if DPI is not going to give us additional guidance, um, just for the public's information, I requested information, more guidance from um, the DPI attorney on three queuing on uh, last Friday, October 11th, and they said they were unable to get uh, us additional guidance. What we do have for guidance is what DPI has posted on their uh, Wisconsin Reads website. And we also have a letter from legislative council. So I guess those are the two documents that we should be considering then as we discuss this in the future. Agreed. Uh, can I just ask a question and anyone can clarify this, but it seems to me that the interpretation is that any queuing or use of pictures is wrong and considered queuing. Is that the interpretation that we are operating under? Prepared to give a visual to that <laughs> and then we can talk about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, just and Katie chime in. So Brownie I mean, has... I could talk about what, you know, an explicit example of, um, do you want to give me my explicit, shall I give the explicit example? Um, so if if the lesson is on say a short u word and the the student is struggling to decode the word and the you know they're prompted to insert a picture instead of sounding out that short u word that's decoding i'm sorry that's that's cueing um why are we not decoding those sounds um i think you could make a better argument for 
using cueing um, to determine meaning, the meaning of a word. So for the audience that that doesn't know, you know, three the the definition in the law of three cueing, and I'm going to bring it up quick because I don't want to say it wrong. Uh, say here, sorry, just one second. While you're doing that, the basic three cueing that we've talked about in the past is from a teacher standpoint, right? Semantic, syntactic, graphophonic. This is, these are the images that you might see in classrooms that are teaching three cueing, um, where the kids are looking at the picture and thinking about what makes sense before they look at the letters in the word, the, the grapheme, phoneme correspondence in the word. And we know from research that that creates compensators, that it actually slows the learning to read process, which is why it was part of the law to not allow that practice to happen regardless of the resource you're using. So, and that's why the teacher training is happening, why the, liter the leadership training is happening, so that we are all aware and on the same page of the why behind that, um, what feels like kind of an arbitrary, you can't cue, but there is, um, a language side to this that that is important to point out too. So when it comes to decoding the word, it's not useful. When it comes to thinking through what the word might mean after you've decoded it, using context, it could have a place, but it, but it's really not three cueing at that point in the way it's defined. So go ahead, Katie, help us with the law wording. Oh yeah, Barb put it in. Um, so if you can't access the chat, I will just read it. Um, three queuing. This is um, in Wistat 1180151C. C. So three queuing means any model, including the model referred to as meaning, structure, and visual cues, or MSV of teaching a pupil based on meaning, structure. So so meaning, comma, structure and syntax, and visual cues or memory. So, for instance, looking at the words, the other words in the sentence to determine the meaning or to determine if you think a noun or a verb should be the word that you're having trouble decoding or glancing up and looking at the picture, those would be, uh, that would be the cueing system. Right. And you do, you're doing all of those things before you sound out the word. Before you go back and you, and you look at each sound and you blend yes. it together. Or instead of, right? Instead of going oh. back and um, sounding out each sound. Yeah, skipping the word, not good. Um, and word, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is this has been the definition that I've been operating under, and I think that that's the case for most of us. But I want to be sure that we're we are on the same page as we're in the final uh, our final program, and keeping in mind that uh, that resource is putting at the front their structured literacy lessons and their dyslexia program as a way to support the coding process, the decoding process. And they're leading with that. So um, just something to keep in mind as we're finishing out this last resource. Go ahead, Barb. Yeah, one of the things I'm gonna summarize, one of the things that I heard in your discussion um, about the earlier example, the earlier example, which I believe was from Wit and Wisdom, is that correct? One of the things I heard in that example um, was a reference to something like if the student has not developed this skill yet, or if the student is not capable of not yet capable of decoding the word based on the instruction that they've had so far. Um, and I guess I'm wondering uh, if there's anything else you want to say about that in relation to three-part queuing or yes. comment on all, at all on how that is or isn't um, three-part queuing, because for me, that's kind of an important distinction. So if they're, if they're prompted, if they haven't learned the strategy, if they don't know the pattern, then the teacher tells the word. There isn't any, like, let's take you away from the word. Let's look at a picture. Let's think about what makes sense. The teacher should provide the word. End of story, full stop. So, um, but <laughs> that's my take, Katie. There's not eight of us on this team, so no, I'm Katie. nodding so head or so hard that my head's gonna fall off. Yes, Amy, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you know, I think that kids will just 
most kids know to kind of guess and look around the words and find a different meaning if there's no adult there to help them. And that's fine. They're doing it on their own. I think that when I have a problem is that it's taught as, as a strategy, whereas I'm wondering why are we not going back and decoding that word? Why are we not looking at sounds? Or um, instead of giving the word, the teacher could model decoding and saying, you know, this is how I would decode this word. This word is this, and then move on. Cause then you're, for the kids that are above that level that they've already been taught, they're learning the new skill and they might need only a few exposures. So then they've already got it. Exactly. Anyone else want to chime in? Holly, Megan, Itzel, Molly. I know you guys are kind of closer to kids, whereas Joe and Phil are a little further away from the kids. So. I mean, I still like kids, Amy. Yes, I know you do. <laughs> I think the only other area that probably we need to discuss, and maybe this is a next time conversation too, is in the ML world, because as an accommodation for ML, pictures are important. And we're talking language acquisition. We're not necessarily talking decoding. And so ML supports within the curriculum, I'm not concerned about when it's categorized as such. And so that's just something I'd like to put on the table. And for those that are wondering what ML is, that's multilingual learner. So if we have a, a child whose first language is not English, then again, you're providing the word, you're teaching the pronunciation and you're building some vocabulary. What does this mean? Um, so. That's an important point too, Holly. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, anything else we need to say about this, this piece? And just return to our agenda real quick and see where we're at. Um, so our future meeting is on Tuesday, October 29th, and we will review our last resource on that date. Um, and then we will be on schedule to submit our list. Certainly, for sure, we already know that we have one program on it on November 1. Um, and we can have that conversation, be thinking between now and the next meeting, what makes sense in terms of communication with uh, publishers and with added notes that we might want to include uh, with this updated document that will go to DPI and Joint Committee on Finance. Um, are there any other things that we need to add to the agenda for the next meeting? You'll have another chance to add to the agenda. So the only thing I was thinking about, Amy, was um, at what point do we put future meetings on our agenda? Um, just so people know what to expect for upcoming meetings, because we we usually do that. So you could communicate that with me or. Yeah, future meetings and setting up for the process for the next round, because this is an annual process. So the window will open up again and we want to be sure that publishers have significant amount of time to uh, the rubric will remain consistent um, because it needs to because we've already vetted twice now with it so um, if there are publishers go ahead Katie reminds me Amy I would I would like to make a motion um, that DPI update the ELCC um, submissions with a statement that says we will be um, accepting submissions spring 20. 25 is that on there currently no, no but you yeah. give me the language and i'm okay. happy to now, do it i should have typed it up instead of saying it yes. um, I'd, I'd like to just put that there now so let me type it up here so that we okay. could do that that's really vital thank you katie yeah i'm happy to do that i should be able to get to it on monday yeah mm -hmm. So again, if you're a publisher, then, you know, the rubric, the process, it's, you know, highly unlikely that that's changing. So you could begin the work um, knowing that when when the window, when the date where you can submit is announced, then uh, you're ready to go. Practically speaking, um, districts are budgeting now and approving curricula now heading into the future school year. 
one thing, Katie, as you look to make your motion or the rest of the team, is do we want to consider a window that's before the upcoming fiscal year, which would be July 1? Um, and so that's, that's you know, I just want to make sure I toss that out there. Mm -hmm. So waiting, because because we're actually waiting an extra year, possibly if there's like some re renewals or like updates, like if uh, HMH comes back and says, whatever, or Lavinia comes back and says, yeah, we made the changes. Um, would they be open to do that before the next fiscal year? I can, I can make the motion right now. We could always update the, the um the website later but this will give companies an idea i think what you're saying joe is we're out of sync like our council is like out of sync with the actual buying correct and correct. decision making timeline of districts exactly mm -hmm. and Part of that is because um, even the wording in the statute said uh, essentially puts a lag in between the um, work of the council and when your recommended list get is uh, is is applicable. So right, so it said that the first recommended list which had to be published by January 1 of 2024 was meant to be for those materials that would be used beginning um, school year 24-25. But to Joe's point, the law also did not necessarily take into consideration the actual purchasing practice of districts. Exactly, Laura. Thank you. Well, do we want to say there's going to be a and... perfect answer because in most districts they want to pilot things and they want to pilot them for at least a semester and so you're looking at you'd have to be done by January to get a second semester pilot in and so I, I just don't know if there's going to be a perfect answer no matter when so most districts I think are looking back at last year's list to make decisions going forward and they'll look at this year's list in a year from now and I think that's just how it's going to work and I um, I just want to take a moment and clarify too that nobody is required to use in our state the uh, curricular on this on the list. Um, there is always choice involved in our state. Um, the thing that is not allowed is the three queuing practice. So um, obviously these are highly vetted sources, but you have options. Yeah, that is my wording. Um... Feel free to tweak if you feel necessary. Mission the DPI posts on the ELCC tab. The ELCC will be oh. accepting materials. Probably should be the vendor tab, huh? Maybe? Yes, yeah, I the think the vendor tab. You get to just you do get to decide though. You don't have to listen to me. Thank you. <laughs> vendor tab makes sense. Okay, we'll switch it to vendor tab, um, but it is the rest of the wording. What it okay. should be. So motion that DPI posts on the vendor tab within the ELCC, right? The ELCC will be accepting material submissions beginning spring of 2025. Do we have a motion to accept this? Okay, so I motioned it and we need a second. I'll second. And any further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to amend the motion. Uh, that it read uh, the ELC be accepting material submissions beginning early 2025 rather than spring. Mm. Uh, I don't want people to assume it's spring with a capital S and then we're limited on when, what. Because my other question is, I don't know who the three uh, council members are that are not going to be back and when does that actually happen is the question. So July like, we, 1. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm so I'm back to the you know we're we're out of sync there too like could we have consistent council members for an extra review um heading into that next cycle so um would you be talking about producing 
two lists in a year then or would I'm you be talking sure. I'm, not, I'm not sure that's what I'm, I'm trying to leave it um open now for consideration okay i just haven't thought about the statute that way before um i'm sure and i don't want to speak for joint finance about whether or not they'd be willing to accept um two lists in a year yeah i think that i think that's com uh, i think we're getting i think we're doing a lot of what what ifing here and some complexity and I'll just put this out there too. We've got a state superintendent election coming up in the spring and we could spend our time thinking about, well, what would that imply? And so I think, um, I'm not saying we don't do it. I'm not, I'm just not saying, I, I don't think I'll just speak for myself. I don't think I'm ready to make a decision on that. Yeah. I, th I think ultimately what's happening here is we would be, selecting the date for which submissions could begin and then a closing date for which they end. And we can do that at a future meeting, but I like the idea of having that all set up before the July one changeover. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Agreed. that's that's my point is, that's why I don't want spring with a capital S, I'd rather just say early 2025 in this case. I think that's fine for now, yeah. I'd like to revisit that though, maybe at the October meeting or the the net, the meeting after that. We have time to think about what that could look like. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion to table the motion uh, that was just posted. It, isn't that that's only because of the early the date there the time frame. Anytime and everything that Bill just mentioned. We have a okay. second to Joe's. Is there a second? So Joe, you're asking to be able to table that and come back and revisit this? Exactly. Like, like not next meeting, but probably November would be my guess. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor say yes. All those opposed say no. Type it into the chat. Yes. 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 Looks like unanimous, I think. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. And then I put um, on the next agenda, then I put time light for submissions just to remind us, Amy. Um, but we. Okay. We don't have to do it at the next meeting. We could do it at the meeting after. That's fine. That's a good idea, Katie. Thank you. Could someone read me the motion or put it in the chat? Thank you. We motion a table it so you don't have to do anything, Barb. That's what it's I in thought. There. I just want to make sure. You don't have to do anything. Thank You're you. good. You're good. Yep. I'll do I'll do some other things. Yeah. Whatever you have going on. <laughs> right. An okay. An impromptu um lesson in boardsmanship is if you don't know what to do, table it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Are we, uh, any further things we need to add to the agenda for next time? I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second, I'll second that. that. Go ahead, Holly. I will second that motion. Okay. All those in favor say yes. Type yes. 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 Nice job, everyone. Yes. Thank you for your work. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.